where where that line is. Now, Grant, I feel like it's a combination of both for sure, but I feel like what we miss sometimes is the value of the nurture side and how important it can impact every athlete we see or you know, every athlete in the program. So the questions that I ask is every elite level athlete has a unique, unique set of technical skills. I mean, I was on, uh, I was on a, a, a you know, there, there are a lot of these uh, kind of like, um, um, like group chats with coaches and after the, um, the, the final, the ISL championship, someone was out there debating Caleb Dressel's stroke. I mean, he was out there looking at his stroke saying, why does he do it this way? Why doesn't he do it that way? And I'm thinking these athletes, these elite level athletes all have a sort of a unique level of technical skills. And they're that way based on all these things that I'm talking about, their background, physiology, anthropometry, evolution, you know, program that they evolved in stuff, sort of kind of put a stamp on who they are today. And uh, they are unique to themselves. And I think it's really important that coaches understand that we can't teach someone that doesn't have Caleb Dressel's physiology or skills or skill set and try to teach them to be like Caleb Dressel. I think every coach has to really be concerned with helping every athlete kind of be who they can be type of thing. So in terms of technique development, the things that we talked about today, and I'll get a little more into it, but we're dealing with the shape foundation, the skill foundation, global drills, and then the understanding and the utilization of kinetic energy. They're all part of the technical side of development of athletes. Um, the athlete development side of it on the holistic side, you know, we're working really hard to get athletes to believe more in who they are. We want our athletes to take ownership over not only who they are, but all their technical development, their training development. They have to understand how to deal with failure because if they don't, they're in trouble. They have to be journey driven, which means it's more about the journey than it is about what you're trying to do down the road. And they have to understand how utilize reward on a daily basis because if they don't have all those elements going for them and if we're not teaching them as coaches then i think we're we're we're, we're losing on the physical side they have to understand that the brain is the most important organ that we train they have to learn to explore not earn to explore but learn to explore uh, they have to understand the sport which means as coaches we have to teach them about the sport i mean we have to teach them the why freestyle works. I mean, they, they can't explore if they don't understand. And again, on the physical side, they have to take ownership, they have to understand failure, and they're journey driven. So there's some commonalities between the two. There's some things unique to each side. But if we're not thinking on all these elements as far as athlete development, I think then I think we, we're, we're missing the boat as coaches. So I see programs as coming from two main sources, general sources sources where coaches completely control the landscape. They control everything that gets done. They plan, map, sort out everything that the coach athletes do and the athletes just show up and train. They don't have to think, they just do. Whereas the collaboration side is athletes are very involved in the program. They take ownership of what's going on, who they are. And the older they get, the more they become involved in the actual direction and how the program evolves type of thing. So you've got these two elements and then really program style you know we've got this technique development athlete development kind of all coming around into this organic super athlete and i feel like the program style kind of dictates how how effective we are at getting to where we want to go and that sort of leads us into the technique discussion we have today which sort of puts us into this each stroke has these elements we have to kind of talk about the shape of what the stroke is managing, what kind of shape, what we're shooting for, what it means. We have to discuss the tensile quality of that shape. So some shapes are somewhat rigid. So your long axis strokes have a somewhat rigid shape, whereas your short axis are a little more, have a little more fluidity to them. Um, there's a timing issue with every stroke in terms of connectivity or they're rhythm based. Uh, long axis, a little more connectivity Short axis is a little more rhythm based in terms of what they do. And then what are the foundation drills for each stroke? Because you can't really teach this, the athlete everything about freestyle. You have to kind of expose them to elements of freestyle and then just say, hey, go figure it out, you know, go explore. And then the last element 
that I think every stroke in terms of discussion today, is there naturally occurring kinetic energy in the stroke? Do we know where it is and can we harness it? Because it's free energy if we use it the right way. So to me, this sort of leads into this discussion about strokes. I don't know where you want to start and how you want to start it, but that's sort of what I felt like would be a good lead in for the, the platform. I think that's perfect. I think that's perfect. And, and what I think we can do is, um, you know, if, if you want to lead with that um, and we can just get started right away with you sharing that. Um, and then as soon as you're finished with it, I'll say, okay, coach, Let's, let's go through your keys for butterfly. And, uh, and then you can jump right into it. We'll do that. We'll go into all four, maybe talk a little bit about underwater kick at the end and uh, we'll wrap it up from there. I, I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna keep you longer than an hour. Okay, but what I just said with that whole thing, did you record that? Is that- I got it, I it's got good. it. Now we're not doing it again. So. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I got it, you're good. Okay. Um, all right, so what we'll do um, is I, I'm i gonna lead us into our discussion on butterfly and okay. uh, I'll just let you take it away. So uh, I'm, I'm gonna start right now with, okay, coach, what would you say your keys for butterfly would be? Well, the, the main things behind butterfly really, on you know, and we're just gonna look at some butterfly in here, but Butterfly is one of these strokes that has, it revolves around rhythm and timing. So if the stroke doesn't have good flow and good rhythm and a, it's a nice flowing harmonic to it, then it doesn't work. Then you end up with um, um, a, a lot of loss of energy through loss of balance in that rhythm and connection. So to me, the number one element in, in, in butterfly is this, this, this rhythm and timing element. So let's just look at um, let's look at some butterfly out there. Um, let's find someone that's kind of, I don't know, just look at the Tenza. The Tenza, you know, we swam many, many years ago. I'm just going to look at her in terms of the harmonic that, so to me, this, the, the, the element in butterfly is the harmonic. And the element that uh, you utilize is the importance that the whole body goes through that flowing pattern. And the keys behind it is if you want this technique to be faster, then you sort of flatten out the harmonic, but the harmonic is still there. If you're going a little more distance orientation, then the harmonic might be a little deeper and a little bigger. Um, and flies evolved that way. I mean, we've gone from a, a fairly, fairly large harmonic to a much flatter, tighter harmonic in, uh, you know, especially in, in current swimming today. If we look at someone like um, the Sansa, say, you can see that she has a very, very large style harmonic. I'm just gonna open up the picture a little more. So you can see her harmonic is fairly large. So you can see there's a pretty huge uh, chest press down in terms of setting up this anchor position. So this harmonic is very large and I think actually is a detractor because it creates a lot of drag. So there's some things that you don't wanna deal with in butterfly. But to me, the number one thing is got to have the harmonic and you've got to teach kids how to, to affect that harmonic and understand how to do it. And um, basic drills are just rhythm skull. I mean, if you, if you look at the main drill behind uh, freestyle, it's just this basically, let me just open up my, and where did my, I got old drills here, sorry. I open up butterfly and there's some older drills. So, so we'll just look at a rhythm skull. So this is just the rhythm, just working with the rhythm in the stroke and just working with the harmonic in the stroke, not really doing anything with it, but just again, it's like I'm saying, just working on feeling the rhythm. And to me, this is the foundation drill in butterfly. Every athlete should be able to do sort of this naturally, this natural chest press harmonic driven, just using the hands, it's just a sculling into that kind of rhythm skull harmonic. Everything builds out around this rhythm skull. So again, I'm just gonna let it flow again. To me, when they can do this and they can feel this, then they have a lot of things that they can work work out a butterfly with that. The hey, other coach, thing with- what, what, are you, what are you doing uh, when an athlete might struggle to find some rhythm? What are some of the keys that you're giving them? 
Mike, they, they, you keep doing this drill till you figure out how to do it, right? You just keep plugging away. And I mean, it, to me, I've even had it to where um, kids, I have kids out of the water in front of me, standing in front of me, you know, and I have them kind of articulate their body and I open their hands at the right timing. So, you know, I just physically take them through the skill on deck. You know, if you put some things on them, it's a little easier with regard to finding that rhythm. But they have to found they have to find this foundation. And the real keys behind this is that there's a lot of kinetic energy in butterfly. So the first the first level of kinetic energy occurs off what I call the chest bounce. So what the chest bounce is is basically taking the the chest and and taking it down below the surface. And basically, if you take this thoracic cavity and you you push it down below the surface and you push it down this way it's going to immediately want to come back in the opposite direction, right? So the, the best way to explain this is that when kids are doing this basic, uh, what I call this, this um, kind of rhythm skull drill, they're also kind of getting a sense that they want to turn the corner with their hands or sit to turn the corner at the bottom of the bounce. As the chest comes back to the surface right here, as it's coming back to the surface, they're setting that anchor position. So you can see this hand turning the corner right here and he's gonna set this anchor position. And this is the same for butterfly as it is for breaststroke. I mean, his hands are a little wide for butterfly, but the concept is the same, is that you want the chest cavity coming towards the surface. You want this part of the harmonic coming up towards the surface because it creates a nice strong leverage position in that, that kind of establishes a really good bolting position. So the combination of this rhythm skull and then understanding how, you know, using the chest bounce because they're bouncing it off the bottom. And, and the easiest way I can describe it to you is to why this works. Um, and I'm going to just stop sharing just for a second. We'll come back to it. But if, if I'm going to take, um, if I'm going to kind of put my home out and I'm going to grab onto something and I'm going to basically use a, a second class lever movement and I want to pull it towards me, then I can maybe be strong, right? If I, even if I get my core involved a little bit, I can get it towards me. But what makes me even stronger is if I can grab something back here and use that as a leveraging force, now I can really be strong because I've got this leveraging force back there. So. What I'm saying with butterfly is, and same thing with breaststroke, because we'll, we won't need to cover the same ground, but the idea is that when you, um, you, you, when you get into this position where you're creating this leveraging position right here, as we set that leveraging position, then we're, it's kind of like using that opposite talking force. It gives you more grip on the water and more able to kind of get that into launch that into that vaulting position. So to me, butterfly, I mean, I teach kids how to rhythm skull, right? I don't get too bent out of shape about how wide these hands are. I don't get too bent out of shape about, um, you know, how they kind of establish that anchor position. Because again, we all know the anchor position has to be more of a high elbow position, right? We all know that. And we ask our athletes to sort of work towards that. But um, again, how, you know, how wide that is will depend to some degree on them. How, you know, in terms of the, the rhythm and the, the, the height of the harmonic, it might be a little wider if they're deeper, not as much if they're shallower. And we'll look at a deeper and shallower harmonic. But the idea is that I want them to understand the harmonic. I want them to understand the value of the chest bounce and how to, where to turn the corner into setting the anchor. And to me, those are, that's the foundation principle in butterfly. Um, we all know, you know, you can teach them where the kicks occur and how they occur and those types of things. But to me, every kid should learn how to do this and understand the value of the chest bounce and understand the timing of it when it occurs. So from there, we can go back to just actual free, the butterfly. We can go back to, let's just go back to uh, Mary in this case. And... Uh, Again, if you look at the, the situation with her, and again, she's very deep, but again, her chest bounce, the timing where she doesn't turn the corner, she's not very using it very effectively, or because she's so deep, she pushes down to push her body up type of thing, so it doesn't work nearly as well. Um,
probably the, the, the athlete that I liked the most uh, was a, an athlete named Natalia Jedrezak. And uh, she's very narrow, but she's very flat in her harmonics. So her harmonic is, is kind of more power based. It's very flat type of thing. And the idea is that when she sets that anchor she, with that chest bounce, she turns the corner, sets the anchor. Again, she's fairly narrow. But a lot of people talk about butterfly, and I feel like the hands have to move away from the body, back towards the body, and back out underneath the body. So there is this, really, it should be something that looks like this. It's a very flat S. People think of it as an, think of it as an hourglass shape type of thing, but it isn't because the hands move away from the body, back towards the body, then back away from the body. And uh, essentially, the body just travels past that position, right? So that's how uh, ultimately what we're working on, thinking of working it towards. So you can handstand, start outside the shoulders, skull towards the inside underneath the belly button, and then back out. And you can tell that she's holding water very well in this is because if you take a look at these bubbles right in here, if you look at all those bubbles, you notice that there's, they kind of slip off her hands just a little bit as she goes into the in sweep, but they stay pretty close. They're on top of her hands. They're still on top of her hands. You can see even to the out sweep. So these same bubble, the bubbles that were back out here are now down here. And you can see when her arms enter the water again, right now, the double trail is back here. So she's pretty much tra traveled an entire body length with uh, one arm cycle, which is very, very efficient in butterfly. So really these, these bubbles to some degree give you a pretty good indication. If you're a coach and you're looking at your butterflyer, then a lot of times you'll get to a position like here and your bubbles will be back here. And you might be in that exit position and your bubbles are back here. And you can tell that's a significant amount of slippage between the two, right? And you can tell slippage in butterflies simply by looking at the bubble trail and where they are. But again, to me, the hands have to enter in front of the shoulders. There has to be a nice out sweep to the outside as you go into your chest bounce phase. They can sweep back in towards the inside as you kind of connect and get into that vaulting action as your, your harmonic goes towards the surface. They squeeze in underneath, kind of thumbs almost touching, and then they go back out past the hips as you finish that harmonic into that next bounce. So um, to me, I, I still go back to butterflies being this, um, again, very, very, uh, depending on like a, like a wide harmonic or a shallow harmonic, um, that's really up to the athlete involved. Everyone has to get into this nice high elbow anchor position because it establishes a much stronger anchor position. Um, the hands have to be moving away from the body, back towards the body, then away from the body. And, and to be honest with you, Mike, that's just the concept of sculling. That's how we create anchor positions through the flow of water over the hand. And uh, to me, the rest of it is just letting kids explore. We know we have to kick the hands out. And that's what I want to talk to you about, in. Coach. Yeah. Is, uh, you, you're really adamant, Jonty, about teaching athletes to explore their stroke on their own. I think many coaches have a set idea of what they want technique to look like. Can you talk about why it's important to let your athletes kind of discover what works for them and not necessarily stay tied to uh, some of the dogma that they might have been taught as coaches coming up through their career? Um. Yeah, because everyone's different. Everyone's sort of unique in their way. Um, you, your hand size, the, you, the the length from your shoulder to your hand you, is, is different from different people. And uh, to be honest with you, how you swim really should be relative to your anthropometry. And you can't sort of get there if your coach doesn't say, listen, rhythm and timing is the foundation. Make sure you get the bounce. Make sure the bounce, make sure you're in sweep. You know, you, you're going to turn the corner uh, as, your, as your, your, your chest cavity comes back towards the, the surface to cr create that kind of vaulting position because that in sweep, you know, as the hands, that in sweep, as your hands kind of sweep to the inside, that's where the power is. That's where you create the biggest vaulting butterfly. And if you connect that vaulting action with the, the chest bounce and get it just right, then you're using naturally occurring kinetic energy to kind of help create the stronger anchor position. And then you kind of clean it off, you know, you clean it off with that next out sweep this way. And, and to me, 
that depends on really who you are. If you take a look at someone like Michael Phelps, he has a decent amount of, uh, if I look at a power chart on someone like Michael Phelps, um, if we have a, a time, so as his hands enter the water, he creates a little bit of power. So he, his out sweep and his in sweep underneath the belly button creates a little bit of power. But then basically what he does, he puts this big thumping kick on the back end of it, right? He puts his face out there with his chin forward in, uh, it's not a really good chin, but he's always looking forward in the water with his chin on the surface of the water after this combination of like finish sweep, big dolphin kick, and uh, he swims a fly very unique to him. And, and it worked very well for him. I, I don't advocate it for every athlete. I certainly don't, I wouldn't teach it to every athlete, but it worked very well for Michael. Uh, and, and to be honest with you, uh, to me, I'm more rhythm based in what I'd like to do. And if I drew that same graph, I'd see kind of power, you know, your power phases. This is the, this is the first, this would be the out sweep. This would be the in sweep and then Kind of underneath the belly button and then the finish sweep and the hands exit right here so that would be showing the 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 power increase or the velocity increase during that stroke cycle but you again i'm just going to keep coming back to the same thing when, when i have kids in camp um to be honest with you i spend more time teaching them just 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 this that's all we just spend hours doing just this because once you learn this and you learn the balance and you feel the balance, you can then add a complete cycle into that. And you can, you can play with, okay, how wide do my hands go outside? You know, how much out sweep, in sweep, out sweep am I gonna have? You know, um, it, it depends on the strength of the, the, the athlete involved, but you just let them play with that. Put a pair of fins on. I would never teach butterfly without putting a pair of fins on your kids. And then to play with that when they're younger and weaker, they tend to want to go too wide. Um, that's natural. But again, to me, the 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 what pre day pre you know comes in front of doing butterfly is just learning how to skull. I mean, if they can't skull, if they don't understand sculling, if they don't understand the concept of sculling, then they're in trouble. You know, just uh, just to begin with, anyway. John, what do you what do you wish that more of the athletes who you work with in the later stages of their career, what do you wish they had as young club athletes that you're not seeing? Just, just being being put into environments where they have to think. I mean, just think, you know, get in the water. So this is just an example of someone just sculling, right? Just with a pull boy in feeling and, and just feeling how to propel the body based on the pitch of the hand, kind of feeling how the pitch of the hand impacts everything that he does. So just that pitch of that hand, creating flow over that hand, again, just draws the shape down the pool, just basically draws the shape down the pool, in sweep, pitch of the hand, same thing again. Again, sculling, understanding sculling and how important sculling and feel for the water. Look at the shape of his hand, look at how his thumbs off, look at how his fingers are spread apart. These are all elements that are important in sculling. I mean, most kids want to put their hands to where they're tight together. They're just in this tight, tight shape with the thumb right there. And it's the biggest mistake they can make. They really have to be completely relaxed with their hands. So to me, sculling leads into rhythm skull, leads into single arm where you work the single arm into that rhythm skull where you work with your patterns, your out sweep, in sweep and out sweep type of thing, getting the balance involved in the whole process. So oh, sculling into rhythm skull, into single arm swimming, getting the timing of it, and then um, kind of just work around that. The only other thing I, in teaching young kids to swim, but do butterfly, is if you're lucky, if you have a pool that has a depth of about six to seven feet, I love to make them jump off the bottom of the pool. And when the hands get right to the, at the surface, they do the out sweep in sweep, out sweep, and just shoot their body up above the surface of the water. And the idea is they wanna get their hands right at the surface of the water and finish with their hands right at the surface of the water. And it's a great, I think, proprioceptive tool for them to sort of feel it. They get a jump off the bottom. So they have that naturally kind of, that kind of energy working for them, but they get the sense of, okay, my, my body really has to travel past my hands and, and bottom jumps, I think, really help them 
number one, get a feel for that. Number two, they get a good feel for their hourglass or S-shaped pattern, whatever pattern they're going to do. They get a feel for how wide they want their arms to go. Um, all those things can be kind of kind of explored in that area. But to me, if you don't have rhythm, you don't have anything. And then the only the last thing that I haven't really touched base on in butterfly is the throw. Um, so, you know, when you are in that recovery process with with your butterfly, your hands in that throwing process, when you throw your hands back into the water, into that chest bound area, you actually have that kinetic energy of the throw. So if the throw is managed from the core, so this is, uh, sorry, this is not butterfly, but. Fair to say that movement is more, a, we want the athletes thinking of it as an inertial movement rather than a muscular movement. Yeah, to, to me, this, the, this, this, um, let me use. So this action as there are, again, managed from the core, everything from the core. So that, that action of throwing into that position, that throwing action, right? Just that action there is kinetic energy. And if you manage it from the core and you allow the throw to kind of draw the shape down the pool in, into that harmonic, into that chest press harmonic, and you, you teach them how to do this at a very young age, then they learn how to use that throwing kinetic energy that's there that they can harness, um, but it has to come from the core. I mean, too many people feel like their their butterfly, the, the arms, the, the shoulder manages the recovery process. I mean, you're lifting the arms up using the shoulders. And to be honest with you, that's not the way it works. It's not the way it should work, put it that way. It really should, everything should be managed from the core. Um, you should be doing a reverse throw kind of exercises in your training program. So the idea is that in order to get this, you actually have to train the path this way. So you actually have to be doing resistance work in that direction. So you need some kind of um, tubing in this direction and working resistance against tubing in the opposite. So you build up some, strict, some strength in the recovery motion and you learn how to anchor the recovery motion from the core. And then you take that into the water and you use it in terms of that kinetic energy. So to just to kind of kind of pull everything together, we're taking this natural bounce, this natural rhythm bounce, the rhythm timing bounce, setting that anchor vaulting position immediately that as the, as the chest comes back towards the surface to give you that leveraging position, the big strength power movement is this out sweep into this vaulting action, into the in sweep, into another out sweep. And again, basically using that kind of throw as kinetic energy and that bounce as kinetic energy into the anchoring position. But put a pair of fins on your kids, teach them how to rhythm skull. When they learn how to rhythm skull and understand how the bounce works, you can play with the throwing action. You can just say, okay, we're just going to work on the throw. So they can just work on feeling how the throw draws the body down the pool. So they can do a flutter kick into one impulse, into a nice throw and just feel how far they glide and take that glide and the feeling of that. And then just put it all together, play with how much undulation, how, how big the harmonic is, how tight the harmonic is, and make sure everything comes from the body. Everything has to come from the core. Everything in butterfly comes from right in here. All right, when you swim butterfly with your arms, you're dead in the water, you, you can't do it. And your timing of your rhythm is gonna be a little different for different people, depending on how much you take that kinetic energy on the throw versus maybe just going right into your anchor position. Um, depends how long your, long your arms are, if they're shorter, it's going to be a different dynamic for people with arms that are longer. But to me, it's all playing around with it. I mean, I, I've run into too many people at the collegiate level that have no concept of kinetic energy, never learned how to utilize it effectively because they weren't taught to, do, to utilize it when they were young. I think we're ready for backstroke and we'll go from a discussion that was based primarily on harmonics into rotation, I'm sure. Well, interesting. Uh, I mean, a lot of people, um, let's, let's just look at a couple. Uh, let's take this guy. He, he's a pretty good backstroke. I'm going to say who this is basically, but basically backstroke is, um, again, we're looking for a shape. I uh, don't hear me. Uh, 
uh, my iron has been kind of wonky lately, but number one, we're, we're dealing with a tensile shape that we're propelling down the pool, right? Right. So we're taking the tensile shape that's going down the pool. Um, the key to backstroke is understanding that what drives the shape are the legs back in here. So everything about the legs, the timing, the rhythm, the connection, the rotation, all that is dictated by the legs. The arms essentially just fit into what the legs do. So there's a lot of, not, I wouldn't say disinformation out there, but people talk about backstroke as being a canoe shape, kayak shape, and how all these things. To me, canoe kayak means sort of the same thing. It's kind of that, that, that long axis shape that we're basically repelling down the pool. And the more tensile that shape is, the less drag it creates. Too tensile, it becomes dysfunctional, it doesn't work very well, but we want this nice canoe or kayak shape as sort of that, how you, how much tension, how tight you are with your belly button into your spine, and you create your shape, right? So the other thing about backstroke is what I call a whole shape, and, and that's looking at backstroke, that's looking at the stroke from the front. So if I'm looking at it from the front, right, if I draw the shoulders as being sort of flat like this, and the head sitting in there, this is this shape is what is called the hull shape. So the shape of the hull. And we know that hull shapes that have a little more of a, a sort of a V to them actually travel through the water a lot better than flat shapes. So the idea in backstroke is we want a little more of a hull shape that is conducive to increasing, decreasing drag. So instead of backstroke being this kind of flat, sort of flat hull shape, that we sort of, you know, rotate from side to side. That's not a very big head, is it? What I'm looking for in backstroke is the whole shape that's slightly different. So I want a whole shape that looks something more like this. So with the head right in here. And the way to affect this whole shape is that you can't take the shoulders and rotate them around, you know, in front of you. You can't shrug your shoulders forward because that doesn't work that way. It doesn't work at all that way. What you want to do is just basically think of taking your sternum and pulling your sternum down and basically pulling it down towards your, your spine, right? So just taking it down and, and just naturally pulling that sternum down in towards your spine will cause these shoulders to kind of rotate uh, in, in the direction. Now, all of a sudden, you have this different hull shape. And uh, the best way for people to do this is put them into this, uh, put them, put a pair of fins. So get, get a pair of fins on, you know, and, and just stick with a pair of fins on, kick the shape down the pool. So you've got this um, sort of kind of body that's a kayak. And what you're going to do is you're going to go from a flat shape into a hull shape. So you're going to start out with the shoulders nice and flat and the head in this position and kick the legs and they can kick it for about five yards. And then you're gonna basically change into a hole shape and you're gonna feel with the same level of kick, how much change in velocity is. And then you're gonna go back to being flat and then you go back to being hole shape. And it's the quickest tool, it's the quickest way for young kids to understand the importance of the shape of the body. Because you'll find that when your kids get into this more of a hull shape, they go faster. They instantaneously go faster in the water. And they go faster simply because they change the shape of the hull, change the drag dynamic. And um, it, it's good. So to me, that's the first thing that they learn how to do in backstroke is how to affect the correct shape. And again, I'm going to remind them again, it's not about rounding the shoulders. It's about pulling the sternum down towards the spine when they do that shape. And they've got to learn how to do that and get that right before they kind of take any step beyond that. You understand everything good, Mike? That's excellent. And I think a lot of coaches will enjoy working through those stages with the athletes and having them try different body positions in the water really gives them a chance to increase their physical literacy, right? Well, you, you, the, you, the coaches will see it. They'll just watch these kids kind of kicking along and they'll uh, change the shape and they'll just go zoom, you know, and then they'll go back to the flat shape and they'll slow down. Then they'll go into a nice hole shape and they'll go zoom. Right? They will absolutely go faster when they, have, they, they affect the right hole shape. The key, Mike, is making sure how they affect that shape. Right. So 
you know, what happened when you, and sorry, I don't have great drawing tools. It's much better when I'm on a whiteboard, but you know, when you're in this flat shape, you're basically taking the flat shape and rotating it and, you know, and it doesn't, you know, you end up in a position where you got, damn it, half of the flat shape below, you kind of going to that type of position. I don't, I don't like that. When you've got this rotated, this curve, curvy, sort of more of a curved shape to your hull, right, and your head's in this position, you, you're very comfortable with the recovery arm being straight up and down, and you find that your actually leveraging arm is at the exact position below the surface of the water that you want it, and you maintain the shape at the same time, which really, really facilitates re drag reduction and making you go much, much faster. So to me, the whole shape actually facilitates a much better leverage position, which is shallow below the surface of the water and facilitates the recovery of the arm. So I, I feel like when athletes really understand the foundation of that whole shape, then I think it really facilitates them being becoming much, much faster backstrokers. And I hope that younger coaches with younger athletes are just you know, the next day, put them in the water, put their fins on and have them play, just let them play with the shape, kind of get a feel for it, you know, and, and just spend the day just working on the shape and, um, you know, work with not just the, how the whole shape, you know, so we're working with that whole shape down there, but also the tensile quality of the shape itself, you know, how tight are there, you know, when you get yourself into a little bit of a whole shape, you're going to find there's going to be a little bit of curvature here, the head's going to sit maybe just a little bit higher in the water, uh, which I think is normal. So um, again, just playing with the shape. Just feel like that's all they're doing is playing with the shape, whether you call it a canoe or a kayak, I don't care, your call. Um, but to me, the canoe kayak concept really deals with the tensile quality of the shape, how stiff, how rigid that shape is. Got it? So we're, we're really focusing on getting the athletes to get a feel for their body position in the water. Correct. You know, the shape of the, the shape of the hull, where the head's going to ride, going to ride just a little bit higher in the water, right? Not that, not as high as I've drawn it, but because we changed the, the shape of the hull right in here and we've rounded the hull a little bit as well, right? We've gone away from uh, the flat, head which sometimes sits in this position to a rounded kind of head that sits a little high get away from it a little higher position in the water type of thing and it's just playing with that and, and you really got to get your kids enough time playing with that right sure that, and then that from there really in backstroke we haven't looked at much here um, and this is just really about um main things uh in backstroke Again, making sure that the line between these angles, so that elbow to that opposite shoulder is a straight line, um, and then a straight line over here, uh, keeping it kind of fairly shallow below the surface of the water, so keeping it pretty shallow below the surface of the water. Um, so I like to have them do a lot of double arm backstroke. So once I do the whole shape, and once I get them to get the whole shape right, then they do a lot of double arm backstroke because double arm backstroke forces you into this position where you can't get your hands too deep below the surface of the water. So they're in this position where they got their fins on and they're doing a lot of double arm backstroke to keep it shallow. And all I'm asking them to do is just concentrate on kind of side crunching and leveraging the body forward. So there's no rotation of the body during double arm backstroke. It's just getting out here, grabbing hold of a piece of water and just vaulting and vaulting the shape forward down the pool. I like that word vault. And once they're swimming backstroke, Jonty, is it fair to say that the, the strokes are oppositional? What are you what are you trying to get with oppositional? Uh, is it exactly opposite symmetrical, opposite each other all the time? Yes. Yeah. Not, ne not necessarily. Okay. All right. With freestyle, more so. Backstroke, not as much. Okay. Um, the idea in backstroke, and it's uh, um, basically backstroke is, uh, you know, freestyle is rotation driven, completely rotation driven. Whereas backstroke is more of what we call a, a kind of a side crunching action. So when you put these hand in the water, you'll see that there's no rotation. These hips won't rotate at all. They'll stay flat. It's going to kind of grab a leverage position on the water. And it's going to be more of a side crunching action to drive the shape forward. So it's kind of like that side core based side crunching action 
kind of moving the shape forward and the shape goes forward based on the shape, the, the shape hull, the rigidity, all those things contribute to how effective they are going forward. But again, this is kind of a, what I call a side crunching leveraging movement. There's no rotation involved. You can see the leg kicks are basically straight up and down. So rotate in, side crunch, and then rotate out. So you have your rotational kicks, rotate the body, rotate the body out this side into that position. So you can see how the kick kind of changes in terms of this plane that it's on. But again, the real key is that there's no rotation. The hips stay very flat through this phase and again, create that power. Let's just go look at someone like, um, I've got Pearsall in here. He's, he's actually pretty good. I would say so. Well, he's actually kind of interesting. So, um, I mean, you can see, you can see how flat, you can see the sort of, if you start seeing the side to side sway. The reason I like Aaron is, there's a little bit of a side to side sway to his stroke. So you can see his hips sway from side to side. See how they flow from side to side. Well, that really comes from the fact that it's a side crunching action. So when he sits, when he grabs the water and he's fantastic at getting a hold of a piece of water, he's really good at grabbing a hold of that water, you can see. And you can see he's just crunching, just crunching down hard on his side, getting that leveraging action to kind of draw the shape down the pool. And again, on the other side, again, grabbing water, kind of crunching. He's got a little offline with his line here, so he's not as strong on his right side. You really, you really, really honestly want a straight line between those two points. So I don't advocate that backstroke is if I'm setting up a leverage position, this is my shoulder, this is my upper arm, this is my elbow position right here. Here's my wrist, you know, again, and this is the hand in here. I like a nice straight line between those two points. The more the elbow joint comes back off that line, the weaker you get, the less power you can apply. Got it. And Jonty, on the, on the entry of the hands, are those hands entering in line with the shoulder? Um, you know, to be honest with you, I mean, we, we like to think of our hands ending at, we all talk about 11 and one o'clock. Uh, yep. Some people are a little more flexible. They can be kind of a little more back in here, more towards 12 o'clock. Some people want to be about 10.30 and 1.30. Hey, where, whatever works for you as an athlete, right? I mean, these are things that become specific to the athlete. When you look at um, the top few of different people, uh, it just depends on, I'm just going to go, uh, just, I'm just going to show you some of these uh, double arm drills. So let's just do, uh, sorry, been a while since I've been in here. <laughs> No, so sorry. Just pause the pause the thing. So let me just. That's all right. I can I can actually ask you a question while you're doing that. And one thing I noticed watching the ISL this year and and even last year at some of the bigger meets we went to, some of the top backstrokers I'm really noticing. It seems to me that their stroke rate and tempo is higher than it's been. Uh, at that level in the past. So what do you talk to your athletes about in terms of tempo in your backstroke? You know, it's just relative to, their, relative to them. Um, I mean, if you're not holding water, you know, you can tempo all you want, you're not going anywhere. Yep. Right, so to me, especially in the teaching, in, in the development phase, uh, the reason I like to kind of, again, work with the tensile quality of the shape and then Working to me, the progression in backstroke starts with teaching them the shape, teaching them the management of the shape, using legs to propel the shape, using double arm backstroke to get a sense of the leveraging positions and the depth of the hand. And then from there, everything is kick to swim, kick to swim. Basically, so the brain understands the leveraging positions and the process of, and I'm just gonna use this as an example. This is just basically a, an athlete kicking and sculling, sculling till he's ready to kind of vault the body forward. So he's going to scull until he's ready when he sits and he's going to get his arms in that strong and he's going to basically vault the shape forward and kind of basically get a feel for that action, see? So and they're they're really developing some kinesthetic awareness there on their own through this drill. Well, they just, 
kind of sense and feel, you know, get the hands in the right position, get the brain to understand the depth that the hand should be, the vaulting action of the hand, the pitch, all that's just about teaching them how to do that, you know, and so that, that's all this drill is, just learning how to set up the, the kind of anchor position and then vault the shape forward, right? You can see his head rides up just a little bit higher. So again, vault the shape forward. You can hold that shape in his position. And uh, so from here, it's just basically going from here to just kick the swim, basically kick the swim. So um, this is just someone else doing that. But this is just someone that, again, is just basically going from, again, managing the shape. So we're going to start way back here. We're going to manage the shape and how that shape gets managed. And then it's going to add the arms to the legs, basically add the arms to legs. And to me, it's important that you add the arms to the legs, always with young people adding the arms to the legs. And then just let the brain naturally figure out the timing of the stroke. And the timing here isn't great. It's not perfect, but it's the basic foundation drill. So I can take kids, I can have kids in camp. And uh, to be honest with you, I'll teach them how to manage the shape. I'll teach them how to manage that shape while kicking, you know, changing the, the hole into the, I'll teach them double arm backstroke, and then I'll have them do kick to swim, and we'll have a pool full of really good looking backstrokers. There'll be a whole bunch of kids out there going, coach, I didn't know I could swim backstroke this well. This feels really good. And it's very simple. You know, it doesn't, doesn't require a lot of things. It's not a rotation-based leverage kind of stroke. It's a very power-based side crunching kind of stroke so you don't confuse the brain with all these patterns reach in down up down you know digging you know digging kind of when you start your stroke you know get the hand in you know do your hand take the hand in really deep then come back to the surface and down no just keep it flat keep it side crunching get the leverage position vault the shape forward feel what it's like to vault the shape forward finish with your hands kind of basically by your thighs when you do that kind of action and then it, it kind of works. It teaches the brain, it exposes the brain to the basics that they need to incorporate in everything that they're gonna do from that point on. So again, shape, shape management, whole shape, picking double arm back stroke, pick to swim, boom. I love it, I love it. What do you wanna attack next? I'm ready to attack breaststroke if you're ready. <laughs> this is this is the stroke that we coaches could always use a crash course in. Um, yeah, let's let's, go, let's cover a couple of different people. Um, let's see, who do we want to look at here? You got some good good old names on there too. I do. Um, I'm just gonna just some basic things. These are just some um, again rhythm skull. Let's just go rhythm skull. All right. All right. So the same guy, same thing. Same guy doing the same thing. Right. He's working with the bouncer. To me, breaststroke again comes out of the the foundation. Right, the foundation is sort of that bounce. The in sweep occurs when the chest is coming towards the surface. So when you turn the corner, you want the hands at the surface, turning the corner into the recovery. So we're just working on the same chest bounce and the same rhythm skull, and just kind of working with that same basic harmonic. Again, it's the same rhythm. Right, and just learning it. He's a little stiff with his hands. He's not nice and fluid. He's not relaxed enough with his hands. But again, the concept is the same, just working with the bounce. And right. you want those fingers kind of spaced and relaxed, right? We're not. I, I do. I, I absolutely, I do. Um, it, it, to me, they need to be relaxed. Kids need to learn how to skull with hands, with their, with their fingers are kind of spread apart. You know, right? with, you know, again, in this kind of position, Right, they need to be spread apart. Uh, that's that's a whole lecture on its own, just on sculling, why they need to be spread apart, and that type of thing. So, um, basically, um, we're working with different uh, things, but to me, the the rhythm skull. So, the rhythm skull is uh, the most again the foundation for this. 
And again, it's just the breaststroke is the same. You know, when you kind of depress your chest, you create that kinetic energy. When you turn the corner with your hands, the chest is that in sweep is your power in breaststroke. You know, the out sweep is maintaining velocity. The in sweep is increasing velocity into the throw. And so you want to turn the corner right when the chest comes back to the surface. So you have that sort of leveraging action of that opposite action, leveraging action. And then understand that from this position, and again, this is a skull, so for when they actually swim, and that in sweep to that finishing throw is a dynamic, dynamic thing. So now they're getting to a point where they're actually really, really using that in sweep into that kinetic energy throw to take the shape and just kind of draw it down the pool type of thing. Sure. So if we look at, um, um, so if we look at, um, so I like, to, again, to me, that breaststroke, rhythm skull. We're just going to do rhythm skull all day till they get it. And then, uh, the, the, and, so, and again, working with the chest bounce and the timing of the chest bounce and getting the in sweep to occur when they turn the corner to when the chest is coming back towards the surface. Next thing I'm going to teach them is to how to use the hands as a throwing tool. So looking at the kinetic energy of the throw. So this is just working on the kinetic energy of the throw. So here, so we're just working on the kinetic energy of the throw. So this is setting up and just letting that, letting that, that shape kind of travel down the pool based on the throwing action of the hand. I see you're letting them ride that power. You have to, you have to. They, they have to understand um, that it's, um, so you can start with just, up so you can just start with throwing with throwing it out throwing so you if you get if you look at that and just slow it down we're basically taking this action and we're going to be shooting the hand so we're going to feel like the the head and shoulders is going to be drawn down the pool because we're shooting the hands out as hard and as fast as we can so this is kinetic energy and again it's going to take the shape just this action takes the shape down the pool too many people recover their arms and breaststroke, they don't shoot the arms and breaststroke, and they lose this kinetic energy that we're just looking at right here. So, you know, you start out, you know, working on that side of the kinetic energy, and you're just going to basically just work on shooting the hands, feeling it, a little flutter kick back there, and then we might get it, um, kind of put the head in line at, at the end of it. Uh, Yes, we got. Uh, <laughs> that, okay, so this is with a dolphin drill. So we're just going to do this with a dolphin drill. All right, so we're just going to do the same drill, set it up. Fast hands with a little dolphin behind it. Just working on feeling that flow kinetic energy type of thing, right? Yep. And uh, so it's just different for different people. I'm just gonna change uh, my tool that I'm using here right now. Sorry, I need to. <laughs> All right, and then just with them, um, take that, and this, this is just doing the same thing, shooting the hands for the breaststroke kick and ride the glide type of thing. So everything about using the hands as a kinetic energy tool is about setting it up and then feeling it. I mean, there's a lot of traveling going on here. I see that. The timing of that. So, and just feeling, playing with that. The, you know, you she's getting maybe in a little too deep on a dive type of thing at this stage, but it's just playing with this. And this is just this with the dolphin kick. So this is with the dolphin kick, which precedes with the breaststroke kick. Again, again, feeling, feeling how the kinetic energy of the hands creates velocity. Got it. Kids, you got to feel that. How much can your hands create velocity? It's right. such an important piece of the progression. I feel like to have the athletes really get a sense of the power they're creating. 
Um, from there, I, you know, we're just working with the kick. I mean, the, the main thing with the kick is just making them kick with their, with uh, again, kick to kind of, kind of get their legs into the right position and then allow them to kind of feel that line when they kind of feel like they're just using it as a leveraging tool and then driving the shape forward and kind of holding that toe point at the end. I'm not doing a really good job of filming here, but holding a good toe point at the end. Again, really holding a good toe point at the end. Are we seeing those, are we seeing the palms or the uh, the bottoms of the heels kind of finish together there, Jonty? Well, the, the idea is that really, if you when you do this type of drill, when you're working with us, and I, I like to have them do it on their back because I really want them to finish with a really really good toe point at the end. Right? So I want to see this toe point at the end and that glide with that toe point at the end. So if they snap their, their feet together into a toe point, they actually close the legs the right way. They actually get the legs closed the right way. And then they feel, again, how far can the shape, I'm, I kind of got to go back to my original tool here. Sorry, I'm just going back to uh, edit. I'm going to open up, don't save anything. <laughs> I, I, I ended up with so many, so many, so many things in there. <laughs> it worked against me. I had so many things lined up in there. Again, that toe point to me is, is is central. So again, right right in this this toe point right in here to me that's essential. So and again, riding that shape and line. So uh, again, I, I'm I'm kind of bouncing around. The coaches can kind of kind of feel with different things, um, but to me, the the main elements of a breaststroke and this is when I teach it in camp and I teach it to kids in camp. I teach them the rhythm skull with the bounce. I teach them how to use fast hands in the throw and get their head in line and create kinetic energy off that. I teach them how to kick breaststroke on their back, you know, when it's set up with breaststroke on their back to where that kind of, you basically putting pressure on the water and you're driving the shape in the opposite direction where you end up in a nice strong toe point at the end with everything in line. I teach them to kick breaststroke on their back so they don't pop their knees to, you know, deep below the surface. You know, if you set up, uh, let's go, let's, uh, let's go Amanda Beard, probably got the best angles. So this is a good example of someone, this is a wave action breaststroke. But if you look at this setup um, for her, Ah, she can't go into the utility image do it this way. That's but incredible at, flexibility there with how she sets up her feet. Yeah, but this, yeah, well, it's, this is called breaststrokers, but this angle here, I mean, this angle here can't be more than 135 degrees. Okay. Right? So when you get beyond 135 degrees, so let's just uh, clean that off. And if you look at that angle right here, it should be somewhere in the range of about, you can't, you know, when it gets below, 135 degrees, 130 degrees, it gets too acute. Mm -hmm. So the more this goes down into here, the worse it gets. You're working you against the pool. Yeah, more drag, right? So the, right. the greater it is, less drag. More drag, a lot of drag. You know, and when you kick breaststroke on your back in the water, sorry, we're dealing with an angle now. When you kick breaststroke on your back, you kind of put your knees, put it in position, keep your hips. Your hips might be uh, just slightly below the surface, but the idea is that the knees don't come above. You collide, you apply pressure in this direction, drive the shape, and your legs end up like that into a great toe point, into a perfect line. Much easier to kick breaststroke on your back and create a feel for what that should feel like than necessarily when you kick breaststroke as much on your front because you put yourself in a position where you end up with problems where you're too deep in terms of your knee position. So in camp, in camp, I'd make them kick breaststroke on their back and do a lot of kicking on their back before they even even play around with kicking on their stomach. And uh, and, and then I just try to keep it kind of simple in, in terms of um, the last thing I do, um, let's see if I, last thing I do with breaststrokers is this drill. I make them do this drill and this is just a drill keep the head in line so they just kick breaststroke. Jonty, what are you talking to the kids about with the width of their kick? 
Well, it's getting narrower and narrower, right? Um, yeah. Everyone's pushing their kids to a narrower and narrower, more of a whip style kick, like this sort of narrow whip style kick. I um, mean, this is this one's actually pretty wide, considering, you know, <laughs> when you look at the the difference here, this one's pretty wide. Let's just get that rib Sony tape because that's actually the three breaststrokers on the tape that are very different. Um, teaching video. So this this is just tape from the worlds in. Um, I think 2009, maybe somewhere around here. So we have three really different breaststrokers in this tape. Actually, we can't see the Swedish girl, but if you look at Reb Sony, she's very narrow in her arms. So this is Reb right in here. So she's very narrow in her arms in terms of what she's doing. So not too wide, kind of shoots arms forward. You can see her heels don't come up too far. This knee angle is very shallow, right? And she just gets straight into the kick. So I think a lot of people took what Reb had to, Rebecca Sony did and was very successful doing, and they've copied it and used it to their advantage. So not too deep in the knees, heels don't come up too far, just a short, whippy kick, right? Get that shape nice and streamlined out front and ride the glide. Um, I don't know who this Canadian breaststroker is, but you can see her hands are a little deeper and wider. So she gets her elbows a little further back, and you can see. Her heels come up much closer to her glutes in this position. So there's a lot more drag involved. She's going to be feel more powerful because she's going to create more power with the kick. Um, and it's going to feel powerful, but it's not, you know, again, there's a lot more drag involved with what she's doing. So we can't see the Swedish kid who's down here, but her, when she gets up, her heels are past her glutes. So she gets to the top point. Her, her, her feet are past her glutes and she creates the most power of any of these girls. And I can't, you know, when I'm playing around with this video, it, it, it blocks that out of my view. But the idea is that, you know, with Rebecca Sony, it's about being slippery, right? Breaststroke is a little more about being slippery than they were necessarily about creating a lot of power. Um, a little more about, again, using just a very small flat harmonic in what they do. Yes. Even someone like, even someone like adding PD has a little bit of a flat harmonic in how he swims, but it's there and the rhythm is still there and the timing is still there and using arms as kinetic energy is still there type of thing. So to me, teach kids how to rhythm skull, teach them how to use the bounce, teach them how to kick without dropping their knees to deep below the surface of the water, you know, to create drag right in here, do that by doing a lot of the kicking on their back. If you want to narrow the kick, be careful with this. Put a pull boy between their thighs and make them kick with a pull boy between their thighs. You know, if you're very loose, you can put a freaking band around their ankles and make them kick with a band around. <laughs> one of those tight bands around your ankles. I mean, there. If you look at the um, um, the, the uh, I can't think of the guy. Swims for the energy standard, the breaststroker. Hmm. Shmanov is a Russian. I mean, he barely, he barely, he barely makes it legal because at the very last second, I mean, you can see with someone like um, uh, with Rebecca, you can clearly see that she sets her heels to the outside. Man, basically, that guy is a dolphin kick until his feet are right here. And then all of it, the last second, he opens up his feet and he just whips them close. Seems, That's it. seems like it. Seems like I mean, it. He just opens and whips and close the last fraction of the second of the kick to make it legal. Otherwise, it's a totally illegal kick. And, so, and that's sort of where people are going. But to me, in the foundation is harmonic, um, chest bounce, learning how to use the throw as energy. Um, and then how big a harmonic you want to create is up to you. How wide a leg kick, up to you. If you have really great flexibility, then you can get very narrow and be very effective, like someone like Petey or uh, Lily King. If you're not as flexible, you're gonna have to open up a little wider because if you're not flexible and you try to go really tight, you're not going anywhere. Right. Uh, and let me, let, had, me ask, let me ask you about tempo, John T. Again, I exclusive to each individual athlete because we're seeing guys like Adam start to have a little bit higher tempo. Well, Adam changed the landscape in tempo. Yeah. I mean, you know, you know, we were all, you know, if you go back and you look at, um, um, let's say, um, 
if we look at the the evolution of breaststroke from the beginning, when Kitajima came along and he created what I call the perfect line, uh, I mean, he, he really created this amazing line, and he, he, you know, he, he became what I call a traveler, right? And he really, well, Bill Boomer really called it traveling, but again, he really rode the line and really traveled in that line. I mean, if you take a look at that shape, that's an amazing, amazing freaking shape in the water. And he's just maximizing the leg impulse to the max. Um, if coaches want to uh, really see something amazing uh, in terms of the traveling breaststrokers, uh, Ricky Muller Pedersen, her 2191 world record, uh, is it, it, a truly amazing, amazing swim. And the key here is, and um, with breaststroke, is that um, if you look at the turbulence that occurs right in here, um, you'll find that the, the, the really good breaststrokers are able to release that turbulence to where it's down past the hips, down where the knees are before they start the next out sweep. So that's the key. So when you start your next out sweep, where is that turbulence? And you can see he starts his out sweep. If you were seeing this above water, you'd see the turbulence would be back in here somewhere, right? So the amount of drag that has been created by this shape moving through the water when the hands start the next out sweep will determine the effectiveness of that out sweep. You know, if you're carrying a whole bunch of water, you're not going to be really good in here at all. You're not going to be strong. You're not going to be working nearly as well. So when Ricky Muller swims a 219 breaststroke, her drag, her turbulence is back here. I mean, it's almost around her, her calves when she starts the next out sweep. And if you look at it from the top view, you'll see that there, the, the turbulence, you'll see, just watch the turbulence on the hips, just, just float all the way back to here during the next out sweep. And to me, that's one of the keys in breaststroke is how, much, how you release this turbulence so that it's not there. So As she's to, really swimming in, in what we would call clean water. I wouldn't call it clean water. Everyone has clean water. They're just not carrying turbulence with them. I mean, if you look at the, in the background, you can see um, this is the, the second place swimmer. Um, oh, yeah. And, and we're, you can see his toes are dragging through the water. His head's above the line. I mean, there's just all kinds of places where he's just creating extra drag in the stroke. I mean, to me, breaststrokers, when you're, when you're doing those um, simple things like that uh, flutter kick and, and dive forward, you know, the, the drills when we were just doing the fast heads with, um, you know, and we're just flutter kick into breaststroke, you know, into this line, she's working on that line at the same time. She's working on maximizing that line, maximizing that shape going through water at the same time. And I think that's so important that kids kind of feel that, sense that and understand that because when they can do that, they can ride that line, they can feel how effective that line is. You can see how far she'll travel just on that one impulse. And you can see that there's decent velocity, velocity associated with this. Again, the combination of hand throw into the leg impulse. Again, throw tight, and again, that tight line. So just to finish up breaststroke, I mean, uh, it, to me, it's, it's about, uh, again, the harmonic, the chest bounce, the timing of the, the chest bounce, um, making sure that you use your hands as a kinetic energy tool, making sure you don't drop your knees too deep below the surface of the water to create too much drag. So kicking on your back solves that. You can work on narrowing the kick if you put a pullway between their thighs. Uh, you can get extreme if you put a band around their ankles. Right? <laughs> Um, but I mean, these are this is what coaches are doing right now. This is what coaches are actually doing right now. I just be real careful with young kids when you introduce them to these kind of things. Just do a little bit, just a little bit, and it needs to be feel based. They need to just they need to just be feeling what it feels like. It's nothing hard. It's nothing fast. It's just feel based. It's just exposing their brain to kind of what does it feel like type of thing. Sure. So we, uh, yeah, let's get to freestyle. I'm ready. Um, freestyle, holy cow. All right. <laughs> um, so 
probably um, let me me let me start out now. Probably this is not start today. Let's let's we'll start here. All right. The freestyle for me is again it's uh, maintenance of this kayak shape and having them kick in the water in that kayak shape and they can kick with the hands by their side. They can kick with the, everything in line, but again, is managing the kayak shape, you know, the tensile, the tension and, that you have in the shape. Um, and again, you can kick, I, I ask my kids to kick in a very loose shape, very loose, you know, kind of, kind of out, kind of loose type of shape, and then slowly tighten up and tighten up and then feel how much faster they move as they tighten up the shape. And again, you're using the belly button to kind of pull the belly button into the spine, rotating the hips into a neutral position, and then just tightening up the shape to change the, the, the drag quotient and uh, increase velocity with the same level of kick, simply because you're tightening up the shape. So you want to get a good feel for what that feels like. And remember, again, freestyle is a very leg-driven element, so legs drive everything that the legs drive the rotation in the stroke, the legs drive the timing in the stroke. Um, basically everything is leg driven in freestyle. But I'm gonna start us at sort of at the end. So I'm gonna show you something and we'll come back to it. And we'll come back to something. So we're gonna look at uh, this freestyle. So this is a kind of a traditional freestyle here. You can see a nice kind of uh, normal high elbow, kind of high elbow anchor position freestyle kind of normal looking kind of freestyle. I'm gonna back it up so you can see it looks this traditional looking, really nice looking freestyle, right? Yeah. She's got fins on, makes it looking good, right? And now she's gonna change into a dynamic kind of kinetic energy freestyle. Can you see the difference? Yes, immediately. Straight right? up, so, straight down. Right, so this is a kind of, a one day lesson teaching a kid how to use the dynamic of rotation, kinetic energy of rotation into what she's doing. So when we look at the traditional style, um, basically she puts the hands in, everything looks normal, gets the high elbow position. Again, you can see that this high elbow condition is not connected to the opposite side at all. The opposite side is basically sort of in its own little world. It looks normal, it's very shoulder. It's kind of what I would call kind of arm driven type freestyle. The same thing on the other side, you can see that this, this left arm recovery is not connected to what's going on underneath the water at all. If we change that to where we're in more of a kind of like energy, kinetic energy driven. So now I'll just go to the left side. So now when she puts this hand in the water, it establishes this anchor position and she's working on vaulting the shape forward, she's gonna take the kinetic energy of the opposite side throw. So she's gonna connect these two together this way. And then she's basically gonna vault the body forward off the throw. And again, vault the body forward off that throw. So, and this is, like I said, this is just one lesson, working with one lesson, just learning how to do this. So let me come back and kind of, um, I think if I have this in here, I might have to go dig for this a little more. You could Come even ahead. tell, it seemed just watching it, you could tell the velocity when she made that change looked to be a little bit faster. Oh, she holds a much better anchor position. She flows, she's body based in what she does. Um, I'm going to take you to um, uh, a swimmer. This is just a swimmer I was working with a year ago. Um, so this I use, and I've shown this to a lot of coaches through the years, uh, in the last couple of years. But basically, uh, this is about teaching an athlete's brain how to connect the top side throw to the bottom side anchor position. So I'm doing a couple of things here. I'm basically going to create a little bit of resistance to get the hand below the surface of the water. So I use the Fini kind of, I don't know what they call this. I think it's an alignment kickboard. So I use the alignment kickboard. So they actually have to kind of press down. So they 
kind of extend the hand into the water and they have to actually push down just a little bit before they set the anchor position. And I want them to learn how to press down before they set this anchor position. Then I put like a, a one pound weight on this wrist and I want that one pound weight on the wrist so the brain says, what the hell is that one pound weight over here? And it makes it a lot easier for them to feel the kinetic energy of the throw and connect that kinetic energy to that press action. So you can see she's not, she's not strong enough to handle the kickboard and she doesn't handle it very well. But <laughs> But this is just me again putting herself, putting this athlete into a position where she had to learn how to again apply pressure to an anchor position and then connect the throwing action of the opposite side into that action. And you can see she doesn't handle it very well in here, not very good right in here, because uh, she's just not strong enough to not strong enough yet to handle it. But this is the teaching process. So um, you know, I put athletes, you don't even need the weights here, but you need a little bit of a small paddle. Um, you need them to be kicking on their side with fins on and feel like they have to press down, press, keep the hand shallow. So the hand has to be shallow at the surface, press down into the leverage position, into the throwing action. So I'm just going to let this run. I'm just going to get the chunk off the screen and, and just sort of let it run. Again, the idea is teaching the brain how to connect the two. So is there a, there's a slight pause there between strokes. Oh yeah, you just, you just, you just, she's just working right side, left side throw, right side leverage position. So she's just working on the left side. That's all she's doing. She's working on that action, learning how to do that. But let's get back to freestyle. This is just, working with the kinetic side of freestyle. Um, going back to... Uh, to swim. So this is just basically a uh, kick to swim. And to me, um, in freestyle, you know, I, I spend a lot of time with camp kids learning how to uh, work with the shape, just working with the shape, the ma shape management of the shape. Um, we work with sculling to kind of work with that leveraging position, and we can look at different leveraging positions after this. But to me, this is the nuts and bolts. Again, get that shape in the water, initiate the legs, to propel that shape. So now you're basically, the tension and the level of tension that you have in the shape is important to understand as an athlete, how much tension is there. And then basically add the arms to that shape. And she swims a more traditional style and you can swim this with a straight arm style. But the idea is the basic drill, the basic foundation drill is kick this one you know, learn how to kick with the shape and then kick the swim. And, and by kick to swim, you're basically saying, I get my leg timing, I'm gonna put my arms into my leg timing. So um, that can be sort of do the, the same thing, but just speed it up a little. So we're just speeding it up. And you can play with all kinds of speeds here, I'm sure. All right, she's speeding up. And this, this one feel actually sort of, this one should accelerate into a straight arm. She'll end up in a straight arm at the end. I think. Oh, yep. Yeah. So, um, but to me, uh, you know, there, uh, I'm just going to show you some kind of straight on freestyle drills. Can you talk a little bit about it, Johnny? Because so many coaches, especially at the club and scholastic level, seem to be tied to that high elbow recovery. <laughs> this is teaching straight on connecting top side to bottom side. 
And do you have a band on those paddles? No, he's got a stick in his arms. Wow. This is, uh, so you can see there's no paddles on these. Just, just working on connecting top side to bottom side. That's awesome. This is teaching kids how to connect, like I said, top side to bottom side. Um, this is just uh, working, looking at it just acutely. Um, God, you know, let me just. And talk a little bit about head position here, Jonty. What, what do you, is it again, a, a unique thing to each athlete? Yeah, it differs with athletes, but again, you know, you're dealing with a, a craft, you know, you're dealing with a kayak, right? And, and just like you paddle a kayak, you know, when you, put, when you put one paddle in this side, you know, you're right in here, you're gonna throw the opposite side to put leverage on that, right? So this is sort of the kayak shape. But, you know, when I tell swimmers, I mean, you want to have everything in this perfect shape and you sort of want to have this head position in this perfect shape. And when you look at a boat at rest, it's perfectly horizontal to the water, but <clears throat> we're getting up to swimming at about two, two plus miles per hour. So this is going to come up. This is going to ride up a little bit because the front of the boat is going to ride up a little bit. So you want that head in line and you want it uh, sort of an extension of the spine line. Uh, you certainly don't want to be looking where you're going. You don't want this head up in a position where you sort of look where you're going because that creates a lot of drag and causes the feet to drop. But I don't like to see the head perfectly, you know, even when they're swimming fast, I don't like to see the head down too deep below the surface of the water. They really want to feel like the water surface level sort of hits them about mid forehead uh, somewhere in that range. I see too many people that want to get the head too in line when they sprint and the head's way, so the head's way down here to deep below the surface of the water and that doesn't work, doesn't work as well. So I want the head coming up, feel like it's coming up just a little bit. And exactly what you're seeing with this athlete, he's just kicked to swim basically with a straight arm kick to swim. Just working the, the balance of the stroke connecting the balance of the stroke. I like it. I like that straight arm freestyle. The more I look at it here. Well, let me just show you some comparisons. So these are comparisons, um, some freestyle comparisons. So this is, um, um, this is this is the genesis of this freestyle. So this is Brusquet. Uh, I'm gonna go pretty far down the, the pike here with Brusquet. <laughs> uh, this is Busquet right in here. Um, when I watched this swim, I was just impressed. And now it's, it's not the traditional straight arm, it's more curvilinear, his recovery is curvilinear, but he's perfectly opposite. I mean, he's very opposite in terms of this, probably putting pressure on that. You know, when I saw this stroke, this swim, and um, this is a 2136 swim, and he, he decelerated. So you'll watch the swim. When he gets to the 15, he's gonna actually decelerate his head position. He's gonna just take the gas off right in here, smooth. And I, I thought that was the most amazing looking thing uh, at that time. If you look at the guy next to him right here, um, you can see straight on freestyle, but no connection at all. No connection at all. There's no connection to the anchor position. It's just a lot of like fast moving arms. And to be honest with you, when I watched the swim back in 2010, it was the most sublime looking freestyle I ever watched in my life. And uh, everything I've developed on freestyle has come off the swim right here. Wow. So that, that really changed the way you were thinking about the dynamic. Completely. completely. When, you, when you say curve or linear, can you explain what that means to coaches? Uh, basically, it, basically, it's not the traditional straight arm recovery. So um, if you're looking at um, the stroke here, you can see this recovery, it, it has a little more of a straight arm recovery with a little curve to the shape. 
So it tends to be a little more curvilinear. I see that, um, yep. Right, when the other side is even more, so you can see this side, see how curvy it is. It doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. It matters whether that connection, that anchor position, and that vaulting action is connected to the throw of the opposite side. That's it. I mean, I, and, I, and honestly, to be honest with you, you, kids will, the hard thing about the brain is if you go too straight up there, the brain wants to go straight down here, and that works against you, right? Too many kids get caught in being too straight here, too straight there, and because they're too straight below the surface of the water, it's really squirrely and doesn't work nearly as well. So getting a little more curvilinear in the recovery allows them to be a little more curvilinear below the water, and that works up, and that setup is much better. Yeah, 21-3 in 2010, pretty fast. Oh, it, you know, the thing about it the next day, you know, I love this last, the last 10 meters is just, that's, I've watched this, I watched that last 10 meters about 40 times the night I taped it, at least 40 times. I'm just sitting there, just look at that guy get to the last 10 meters. And then the next day he came and he hammered it the whole way and he went 210 slower. <laughs> So let me just, this is just one last person I'm gonna show this comparison. Um, this is just a freshman to the end of a freshman year. We're looking at this guy right here. You can see how he came in as a freshman. I mean, he's not very good. He's not connected. Legs aren't doing much at all. It's kind of the first races he has as a freshman. That's, that's, that's pretty ugly. So now he's, he's up in here, he's a little better. Um, he's a little connected, he's more leg driven in what he's doing. So the legs a little more involved, he's a bit of shape and platform. He's not totally connected yet, but you can see he's starting to move that way. Not there yet. And this is at the end of his freshman year. So again, you can see the difference between uh, even, you know, sort of September to now we're in February and then the end here is gonna be in April. And you can see the difference in the technique and still not completely there, but definitely in, in process of being there. And again, this just, I'll just go back to that comparison I showed you to begin with. Um, again, this is just traditional looking freestyle, kinetic energy. And I, I, and I don't, to be honest with you, they're freestyle. I mean, when I teach them the shape, how to manage the shape, the kick to swim, you know, they can be they can be really deep. So this is a real power-based person, like someone like Anthony Irvin, who has a very very deep a deep anchor position. So you can see how straight his arms are below the surface of the water. He's almost dead straight below the surface of the water. Very very power-based in how he swims, right? Um, and you can take that to. Um, someone like this, that's uh, just a 14-year-old kid I filmed many, many years ago. And you can see that, again, basically, you can see as the traditional high elbow, that perfect, perfect high elbow action that's going, right? Uh, propels himself through the water very differently. You can see that still, regardless, you know, this anchor position is connected to the rotation of the body. The time of the rotation is a little different. You can see the rotation against that anchor. So the timing of his arm coming through on the opposite side is, is a slightly different from a straight arm person, say someone like Busquet. But conceptually, they're very, much, very similar because you can see that he's creating a lot of leverage occurring that is this leg kick and that leveraging and the leg kick drives the rotation. So you can see how this leg kick precedes the rotation of the body into that vaulting action of the arm. And again, on the other side. So, I mean, this is more traditional style stroke versus the one I showed you versus say someone like Anthony Irvin, who's very, very deep below the surface of the water. And, um, you know, it's just um, everything. So, I mean, understand the shape. Understand the biggest enemy you have in freestyle is loss of balance. When you see loss of balance, it, it causes problems. Let me just uh, actually, I put something on my desktop here. I can kind of share here. Um, this is just me working with a specific athlete. So this is um, looking at an athlete that is swimming at uh, 400 speed, 200 speed, 100 speed and where that leg is, what that leg kick looks, got, looks like at those different speeds. And you can see 
the end of that leg kick is different from the end of this. You can see the toes starting to come around and these toes are really starting to come around. And um, you'll start seeing how off balance they get when they see this is a pretty normal kick oh, at wow. 400 tempo. Now the toes are starting to kind of hook in the water and you can really see the toes starting to hook in the water because the timing is off and the connection is off. And you can see even at, um, at the exit kick, he's really lost balance and you can see how much these, these, sorry, I didn't mean to do that. Um, you know, you can see how these toes have really come around in the water. So this is lots of balance type kicking with regard to the, um, the that freestyle. And I, it, it's just something that to me, the first thing I look at with swimmers is, you know, what are the legs doing? You know, are they out of, off balance, uh, they're going to closed joint positions. So sort of closed joint position kick is instead of the, 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 the feet finishing kind of like in this position, you know, as far as the, the leg is concerned, the feet end up sort of in this position. So the, the, the toes have into, moved into a closed joint position, which shows loss of balance and, and shows extreme loss of balance, depending on how bad they are. So I watch the legs and watch how they kick to see if they do, they get into a closed joint position. If they do, you've got to find the genesis of the loss of balance. But bottom line is, um, again, teach kids how to kick in line, teach them how to manage their shape in line, teach them how to have a very effective uh, a freestyle leg kick with everything in line. Then basically kind of they can play with what kind of leveraging position they want to be in. I don't stipulate any leveraging position in camp I just work with the foundation, kick to swim, uh, teach them how to skull, feel the water, kick to swim, and then let them naturally go to whatever ledge position they're in. I let them work with sticks in camp so they can feel the connection of the timing, the connection of the upper to lower. And to be honest with you, breaststroke, I mean, backstroke and freestyle between teaching them how to create leveraging position and get connected and then kick to swim, they look great by the end of camp. Kids look great by the end of camp. Just, just, just working with the foundational things, not getting too deep into it. Yeah, it's it's so important to make those connections. And after you make a change like that, right, you got to stay consistent with it for it to take hold. You know, for um, for a college age kid, um, it takes you about three to four months to develop a feel for what you're doing. It takes you another three to four months to develop. You know, it takes three to four months to get to a point where you maybe don't have to think about what you're doing. Another three to four months to develop some basic strength in it. And then maybe another three to four, if you're lucky, develop power in it. So when you change, when you, when you say change from a high elbow position like this, if you take this high elbow position, you say, uh, let's go to Anthony Urban. Let's go way down here. <laughs> you know, let's get down really deep. Well, or you can take this kid and say, now I'm going to move you into a straight arm freestyle and not the traditional freestyler. It's going to take a, a good eight to 12 months to utilize that as an effective tool. For sure. At, 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 the, at, the, at the college level. At sure. least eight to 12 months. And I think the longest it's taken me from, from, from scratch to fruition, 18 months. 18 wow. months for an athlete to get to a point where they actually can utilize the value of the things that they, they were working towards. It takes time. It's not an easy, it's not, it's a Pandora's box if you don't know what you're doing. If you don't know how to teach it, if you don't know how to put them in the right environment, it's a, it's a real Pandora's box. So to me, kids are naturally going to go to the depth that they naturally feel comfortable going to. As you, you develop this concept of the kayak shape in line, head position, um, put a stick in the hand, to get some kinetic action on the top, you know, connect the top side to the bottom side, and then just go kick to swim and go kick to swim with a traditional high elbow recovery. But make sure it's connected. Make sure the body is rotating. Oh, let me show you one last thing. Sorry, my bad. My bad. <laughs> my bad. This is another simple thing we do. Um, Nope. Okay, so this is what I call a kayak drill. Uh, I'm not a kayak drill. It's kind of like kayaks confusing with the kayak shape, but this is sort of a drill that they use to kind of connect. So they go from the stick drill to this. So 
So I've got a pull boy in this position. You can see the pull boy sticking out right here. And the reason I've got the pull boy in there is I want them to connect the rotation to that leveraging action. So that leveraging action out front connect to the rotation. And they can feel it because they can feel the kickboard resistance of the kickboard action, right? right? Yeah, I see it. Right. So you put that kickboard in there, they get a, the brain gets a much better sense of that action and how the rotation of the hips, you know, rotating the hips in that action. I'm not too worried about what this other arm is doing up here. It doesn't concern me. I just want the brain to feel the timing of that. So basically we go from kick in line drills to kind of get a stick in your hand to this kayak drill to kick the foot. And by the end of it, you know, they might have a, a shallow anchor freestyle. They might have a really deep anchor freestyle. I, I, I don't stipulate what they should or shouldn't be. Um, they just, I let them naturally go where they feel like they're comfortable going. Sure. Sorry, I almost forgot the most important drill out there. <laughs> Uh, dolphin kicking. Let's just do the thrills. Throw it up there real quick. I'm gonna do it. Yeah. Um, let's start with this. This is a comparison of a, of an athlete. So if you look at the comparison, you can see you know the difference between one and the other. Oh, absolutely, and the undulation. Right. Yeah. So you can see the difference in the harmonic um, is is. All right. So we can see that the athlete down below is a much tighter harmonic. The athlete above is a, a very very different harmonic. In fact, it's the same athlete. He just learned how to really. And this kid was fast. I mean, he came in as a freshman and he could he could scoot down the pool. He, uh, he was quick. Right, but he's he's using his hands more as a path seeking tool, and he's thinking of his hands as a path seeking tool. So you can see how he's using his hands as a path seeking tool. See how those hands do those hands? I see so that. Doing, so he's using them as a path seeking tool. Just understand that. So he's creating the undulation by using the pressure on his hands in the way he's. And I see. I I described it to him as a path seeking tool. And uh, I'm just going to get out of that and get to this because it's a little easier to deal with. That's but a big mistake I've made coaching. I've tried to eliminate that. <laughs> I got to Maybe I'll let them explore that a little bit. No, but this is this is dolphin kicking. This is the way it works. Um, right. So what we're dealing with here is we're creating a harmonic, right? We're creating this wonderful harmonic that kind of creates this fish-like action. So how do you create the harmonic? You're basically taking the chest and you're, you're kind of moving the chest uh, in both directions like this, right? And, and that, 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 chest, that chest press that you see there, that chest press action that you see there is what initiates this wave that goes out the tail. So how do you, how do you achieve that really good chest press? Well, what you do is you use this as a leveraging tool. So you're using this, this platform up in here as pressure in this direction to create the chest press. So if you go back and look at this now, you'll see that he's actually using that as a leveraging tool and he begins pressing, kind of using that pressure, that lifting pressure um, before the feet have finished their down downbeat. So as the feet are getting into the downbeat, so he's got this downbeat going on here and he's already pulling against the pressure in the water to create that action. If you wait to put the pressure on when the legs are done and then you start doing the pressure, it doesn't work. So it's a combination thing that really kind of creates two things. Number one, by utilizing the pressure in this direction right in here, it creates the articulation that you need to create the harmonic that you have in the swim, right? And the other thing is that you want this leveraging action because to be honest with you, you need it because when you're in the downbeat, when you're on your stomach, your chest wants to go towards the surface 
And by using this leveraging action, you get more out of that downbeat. It comes back to when I demonstrated, if I grab against something else, I can be much stronger when I pull something towards me. If I've got an anchor, I can pull something towards me. So because the chest wants to go into this, let me get all the junk off the screen here. So the chest wants to go in this direction and you're applying pressure in this direction and they're opposite each other, right? They're opposite. So the chest moving in this direction is going to dampen the effect of the downbeat, right? It's going to downbeat, dampen that. So what you want to do is by kind of using this as a kind of a scoop to kind of create this leveraging pressure, you actually increase the pressure of the downbeat and you create the articulation to start the harmonic. And you just do it the other way. So now he's going to pull up. He's pulling up to create down. He's going to press down to push up. So think of, the, think of the hands here as a leveraging tool in either direction to create the harmonic that kind of travels up and down through and then just creates the wave that goes out through the tail. And that's really all, that's basically dolphin kicking in a nutshell. So there's a lot more to this, but put them on a kickboard, get their, head, get their hands on top of the kickboard, get the head in this position here, and then basically use the pressure of the kickboard. So they can use the, the kickboard as their leveraging tool and then basically learn how to kind of depress the chest, pop the chest, depress, and just create the harmonic that goes out through the tail using that method. So a lot of learn propulsion how to, in there. Say again? A lot of propulsion in there. Well, they're just learning how to create a harmonic. That's all. They're just learning how to create this harmonic, right? And dolphin, you know, kicking underwater, it, it isn't. It isn't kicking underwater. There's no such thing. There should not be, we should never think of it as kicking underwater. All this athlete is doing is using the water. So, I mean, it looks different, but he is using the water, basically using the water to create vortices, all these vortices that kind of peel off the bottom of the leg that shift the shape forward. So when you use the water, when you articulate the body through the water, when you become more fish-like through the water, you become successful at underwater dolphin action. So you don't even use the word kick. It's just underwater dolphin action. Yeah, forget. I mean, you. I, if you're a coach listening to this, understand this. If I have two sets of 10 kids, and they've never learned how to do underwater under the fifth stroke. And I take 10, the, the first 10 kids and I say, kids, guess what we're gonna to do today? We're gonna to learn how to kick underwater. And they're gonna get all excited because it's gonna be something new. And they're gonna equate kicking underwater with kicking a ball. And they're gonna think of it as a hip down, knee driven action. Drive the knee, so drive the knee down and then just finish up the ball kicking action. And it's not. It's a, it's a body-based, you know, upper torso driven harmonic based action that starts in the upper body and basically goes out through the tail. So the kids I introduced to underwater kicking by using the term underwater kicking will be absolutely compromised for most of their lives. Probably all of it. Sure. The, the next 10 kids, I'm going to line them up and say, hey, kids, we're going to learn how to be fish underwater. And they're going to get all excited because everyone wants to be a fish underwater. And I'm going to show them a video of a fish in the water. And they'll be like, you know, maybe a nice salmon, you know, a nice body-based action. They can see the body-based action of the salmon. And I'm like, get in the water and be salmon. Those kids will learn how to articulate underwater, create a harmonic, and use the water to propel the body, the shape forward. The other kids, they'll be compromised for the rest of their life. Remove the word underwater kicking from your dictionary, you help your whole program. I love it. So, so again, so you, you know, just to me, you, you can get, you know, you can get super wide on your side. There's, there's things you can do with fins. You can really work, kind of working that. This is me up in a place called Cyprus, just filming kids. Kind of working the harmonic from a different point of view on your side. But, um, me the, the the main things are um I understand that you're creating harmonic right understand that um you want to be fish like 
if you want to go faster, um, use this demonstration. Michael, just tie a rope to an object, you know, tie a rope to an object, right? And be standing here and hold the rope. And then basically give the rope a whip and you'll see a wave travel down that rope, right? And if you want the wave to go faster and you say, how do I make the wave go faster? And your kids will say, well, just shake it faster. It won't go faster, right? All you have to do is step backwards and you give that the same whip and it'll just zoom to the end of the rope. It will just rocket to the end of the rope. So the idea is with, with the difference between the comparison is you can see that the bottom athlete swims taller. So the bottom athlete has actually basically really stretched out their shape to where they are much taller in what they're doing and the harmonics are much tighter, but the, the concept of how they affect it is exactly the same. Nothing's changed. Gotcha. Yeah, the, the harmonics, I just feel like are, are so critical in helping these kids understand the, the rhythm of it. Well, it's, it's, it's like, um, if we go back to, let me just, um, hang on, let me just go. Let's go to ISL, this, where's my ISL folder? I was working with uh, Haley Flickinger. <clears throat> uh, and she was really trying to get to that point where she understood that it's a full body based thing. You know, she was just just not getting it here. You can you can see she's trying to use this as a tool, but she's not getting it at, at yet to use it as a tool. She's very kind of tight hip knee based in what she's doing yeah but you know just kind of there's a lot of stuff that we did with her that that i think the key is just learning how to understand how to articulate how to kind of utilize this and then when she came off a kickboard and she went underwater with a fin she was really really good so her brain sort of understood the harmonic and and to be honest with you the key is um the key is knowing that this, this, this front end, this front end scooping action. So when you are in that downbeat, if you're not kind of using the pressure to not only kind of be more effective in this downbeat to create bigger vortices to shoot the body forward, um, to hold the pressure on those vortices because the lungs want to go in that direction. You know, when you use that, you hold the pressure on the vortices to shoot the shape forward. And then you also get to articulate the spine and create the next harmonic at the same time. That's the key. I mean, when coaches know, coaches will know and consumers will feel it, really know that they have the right harmonic when they feel that action of that, that occurring, that feeling that leveraging action and the timing of that, when that all gets in sync, it just goes. It just works. And to be honest, I've just taught this to kids many, many times over. I've taught underwater dolphin action many, many times over. It's a lot of trial and error. It's just do it again, do it again, do it again. Go figure it out. You know, you know, you you get it. Just keep plugging away. You, this is this, and this. They just keep working on it. Eventually, they get it. And everyone can can kick underwater. Everyone can. I mean, everyone can dolphin action underwater and they can get the right feeling of the right harmonic underwater. And when they get it, they'll know it. They'll know it the instant they get it, they will know it. It's really great to see the evolution of that in, in our sport. And now you look at NCAAs and boy, you better be fast underwater. Listen, if you, if you don't know how to create a harmonic underwater, you're dead in the water. And to be honest with you, I've seen some very elite level swimmers that still don't know how to do it. Right? They right. just don't know how to, they don't know how to, again, I'm gonna come back to here. I mean, it's that, 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 that action in, 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 the, in the downbeat, that action. And again, I have kids get out of the pool and I kind of make them work and feel this action, feel it, kinesthetic, uh, feeling perceptive understanding of what it should feel like and then in the water and you know you can do wall peels and 
you know, like I said, with a kickboard and just working, working, kind of using this kickboard as a leveraging tool to work the, create the harmonic, create the wave, and just let the wave go out the body and feel what it feels like, and just keep playing. I mean, I'd spend every Wednesday with my college team, every, almost every other Wednesday, sometimes two Wednesdays in a row, we'd go some work, and we'd have an hour left in workout, we'd start doing wall peels, we'd have partners, you know, one partner would hold the hands above, and then let them articulate both ways and feel the articulation both ways. And then get in the water with the kickboard, you know, work with the harmonica for kickboard and then get underwater and go past cameras. And I'd be sitting with the big, big screen TV going, now, nah, now nah, closer, that's better. You know, you got to get there, you know, just, and they like over time, they all get it. You know, and, and honestly, when you get the harmonic underwater, you are anywhere from six to six, six tenths to a second faster per 25. When you get it, truly get it. Coach, it's been an awesome couple of hours here talking with you about stroke technique. And I'm, I, I didn't want to take up your time, but you put together some great content. And I'm going to have to spend the whole weekend doing clips, but this has been really great. I really appreciate your time. And, uh, you know, to be honest, I felt like it was really half ass. <laughs> <laughs> it was great. No, it wasn't, you know, yeah, I wasn't really, you know, it's like it was more just to have a conversation with you. And a lot of times when coaches have questions, I say, listen, let's just get on a Zoom call. And then I get on my, I get on my, you know, to say, look at this, look at that. If there's, there's so much, look at this, look at that type of thing. And, I don't know, it's just, you know, you just, you, you just, I, I think just to go back to um, where I really started with is the idea is that every coach needs to understand it's their job. It's your job to help your athlete find their best them, their best, what I call their organic, their organic stroke. And you can only get there is if you put them into environments where you teach them the basics, the foundation, the rhythm skull or the shape management and leg driven shape management, whatever what you're doing, and then just let them play. You know, just let them play. You know, and and honestly, when you get at the collegiate level, you, you let them teach you stuff. You know, they can, your athletes will teach you more than you realize at the collegiate level, so. Well, Johnny, I, I really appreciate your time today, and uh, I know you're super busy, and we really appreciate it. We're going to have this episode up on our website for people to access, and uh, we appreciate everybody tuning in. Last question, Coach. Will it take a sub-21-second performance in Tokyo in the men's 50 freestyle to win a medal? No. That's kind of where we've been trending. Yeah, no, not yet. Not, not yet. yet. I can I can think of a couple of guys that are there, but um, not enough. There's not enough what I call critical mass at the 21-0 level. Sure. You know, there, there are a lot of guys in the 21-3, 21-4 range, but they're not close enough to create the critical mass to take it forward. Well, it's going to be exciting to watch, and uh, it, it was great to see you get excited and animated during the ISL this year. It's fun to see Jonty <laughs> get fired up, and uh, appreciate your your stewardship and, and mentorship in the sport, Johnny. So thank you very much for joining us today. Okay, cheers. We'll see you Bye. soon.